Here are some numbers about our arts going habits in the province of Ontario. This for the year 2010. Ontarians age 15 and older who went at least once to the theater, 48%, 37% to cultural festivals, 36% to a public art gallery, 34% to a museum, 15% to cultural performances, and 11% saw classical music. The good news is that despite a marvelous array of aesthetic pleasures to be found on the internet, we went out more and did more artsy stuff in 2010 than we did 20 years ago. All of those cultural activities kept 4% of Ontario's economy humming and employed 4% of the workforce in 2010. But is the cost of maintaining large, artistically ambitious institutions exceeding the capacity or even the willingness of arts consumers and donors and corporations and governments to meet them? Let's find out from Barry Hewson. He's executive director of the National Ballet of Canada. Judith Koch, chief of public programming and learning at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Jörn Weisbrot, artistic director of the Luminato Festival. And Jeff Melanson, president and CEO of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. And we are very happy to have you four heavy hitters in the cultural world with us today. Jeff, I want to start with you, spend a bit of time with you off the top because you took over as president and CEO of the TSO late last year and as luck would have it, from the previous season, you inherited what was essentially a balanced budget, actually a modest surplus if I recall. So given that, does the TSO actually need to worry about its future? Uh, it certainly does. I, what I did walk into while we had an, a surplus the previous year was a $12 million accumulated deficit and a $2 million structural deficit. So we require on an ongoing basis a pretty Herculean amount of fundraising just to continue to offer last year's activity in the next year. So certainly there is a financial challenge and I think what, uh, what we're privileged with in the arts is a surplus of great ideas. I think when you talk to any of our arts leaders, any of our organizations, there's a lot more we could be doing. The funding uh, shortage is really the issue that sort of holds us back. So sustaining the core operations of the institution while also building uh, growth-oriented initiatives, really thinking about dissemination, some of the new opportunities in front of the institution really is a bit of a challenge. Let's look at a couple of more numbers. We mentioned 11% went to a classical music performance sometime in the year 2010. That's more than a million people. That's a lot of people. That's not bad. Your attendance alone was almost, uh, well, it was a quarter of a million people. Is that a good enough number looking forward? Well, I think it depends on how you look at those numbers, right? Certainly, as you say, 11% of Ontarians experience classical music live. Anyone who's watched a film, though, in the last year has seen classical or heard classical music through another medium. We don't tend to think about that, so we're much more uh, present than you would, you would imagine. Uh, the number's not good enough. Um, in Toronto, we're serving a population that's fairly old. Um, the average single ticket buyer for our institution is 59, so we're really missing that younger generation. And certainly the biggest problem facing us is that really that younger audience and the very much younger audience, the children that are in our public schools, who really often don't have access to arts education and really don't attend live performances either. Is your mission essentially to put bums in seats in Thompson Hall for concerts? No. No. Um, we are we're suffering, I think, in the arts community and certainly the TSO, I can, I can speak to specifically, uh, through the sort of Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message. So the economic vehicles, be they concert hall, ticket sales, whatever, become the driving force of how we make decisions. So in a way, the economics that we've chosen to adapt or adopt for our institutions have become the driving force, uh, really f uh, forcing our creativity and our creative hand. So our mandate, when I started, I, I did meet with a number of our staff and I said, what are we here to do? And a lot of them said, we are here to sell tickets to shows, which is not the mandate of the institution. What we, is are, it? we are here to try to make sense of the world using music as our instrument. We're trying to build a better society using the fundamental musical impulse that's within every person to shape how we understand ourselves, how we understand society, how we congregate, and so on. So it's a much broader aspirational society building agenda, and certainly in a city like Toronto where we talk a lot about creative economies, the creative class, that comes from the inspiration that our institutions provide and the experience particularly young people would have, but then every Torontonian, everyone in Ontario would have um, with, uh, with our institutions. You pointed out the average ticket buyer is 59 years old, which means Good health permitting, you've got another 20, 25, 30 years of concerts or maybe even more from those folks. What about the people who are now 10 years old? Are you going to get them? Well, we know. I should say, are you going to get them in 10 or 20 years when they are the ticket purchaser, not just going with their parents or well, grandparents? Well, we were hoping they would apply their allowance to ticket sales <laughs> at the TSO, but, uh, but leaving that aside, 
The National Endowment for the Arts did a great study about five years ago, and they found the number one predictor of ongoing participation in the cultural life of the community was arts, edu arts education as a child. So I would say the 10-year-old today who is not receiving music or dance education or any exposure at all, the odds of them participating is almost or would be almost zero. Um, that's, pro that's a problem for us, obviously, in terms of sustaining the economic infrastructure, but it's much worse in terms of how those young people are being developed. So in a way, we're a bit we're focused on obviously the economic needs of our sector. That's you know our business. That's my day job. But much more importantly, if we're thinking about building great societies, and the art is an important vehicle to doing that, it's really more about how do we ensure those young children have opportunities to experience the breadth and diversity of uh, cultural opportunity available in a city like Toronto and a province like Ontario. So one of the things you're trying to do is turn people onto music through things like your VIP program. What is that? Our uh, VIP program. Uh, is a program that basically is supporting, particularly uh, some of the younger patrons uh, through the institution. Uh, we call it the Impresarios program as well, and that's really drawing in, as any arts organization does, a younger generation of business leader and so on. Um, probably more importantly than that program, I would say, is some of the programming we're doing in education. We currently serve 50,000 students through public school education programs. We're meeting with the local school boards, and our ambition is to serve every single Torontonian, every single young person in the public school system, and obviously private schools as well, uh, through the TSO every year. So that would mean a free performance for every single child growing up in Toronto every year as part of their growing up. Why is that important? Well, that's part of the social mandate of the institution. And if price is a barrier for our education system for some of those schools, and more importantly for those families, we have to break through that. So that's an important initiative for us. In terms of younger patrons, we're all experimenting with things like DJ-oriented after parties and that sort of thing. That's great, but if the sideshow becomes the show, there's really no point in doing that. So for us, it's also looking at how we have to adapt the content on stage to ensure we are celebrating the best of the past, but also that we're creating a culture of innovation around the institution that really is inspiring to younger leaders in the city. Let me invite all of you at the moment now to take a look at one of the monitors around us here, because we want to play a clip from the well-known American arts manager, Michael M. Kaiser. He's got a short list of reasons why he believes the performing arts are in crisis. Roll the clip, please. I've become more and more aware of many trends that are going on in the arts that are making it more and more difficult to be successful in the arts. The loss of arts education in our public schools, the end of the loss of subscription as a viable model, technology that's making it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to get entertainment at home, um, loss of arts journalism, um, as in many, many of our papers. Um, many things that are going on that I think are making it more difficult and very importantly, the aging of our donor base and the lack of replacement of our older donors with younger vital donors. Michael Kaiser with some of the reasons why he thinks the performing arts are in crisis. Judith, I want to follow up with you because in a recent survey of the world's museums, the Art Gallery of Ontario, Ontario ranked 80th, annual number of visitors 757,000, which sounds like a pretty big number. But in what way does the AGO experience the crisis that Michael Kaiser was just describing? Um, <clears throat> we've experienced it in a couple of different ways. One way would be particularly among younger members. They'll, we can track that they've been to our institution three or four times in a season, but they choose to not become a member when it actually makes economic sense to buy a uh, membership. So it's um, uh, not, we haven't quite helped them develop a sense of belonging or commitment to us, so that would be one way. Um, another way is that our audience does not yet reflect the City of Toronto. So our audience is not as diverse as our city is, and that's something that we're working really hard at. Who's your audience? Our audience Not that you want, that you no, have. Our current audience mm -hmm. um, tends to be white women, kind of me. You are the current audience. I am. <laughs> I, I, I hesitate to put a number on it, but white women who are it, between the ages of? Uh, over 50. Over 50, yes. okay. And what's, what's wrong with that? That there's nothing wrong with that. We're very happy to serve that audience. They also support us very strongly, both as donors and as volunteers. It's not enough. We want to, we want to obviously broaden our audience to reflect the city. Because there's an economic imperative to do so? There's both an economic imperative and a social obligation. Social obligation because? Because we believe that by bringing art and people together, people understand themselves, their world, their neighbors in new ways. We, there are studies that demonstrate it builds tolerance for multiple perspectives and different ideas, and we think it contributes to the life of the city. You obviously have a huge chunk of your budget contributed to by the province of Ontario, by yes. the 
if I can use this awful expression, the taxpayers of Ontario. We do. Uh, is that therefore an imperative that the government puts on you? The notion that your clientele have to be your customers, your patrons have to be more diverse than they currently are. No, I would say that the agenda comes internally in the institution. I want to play a clip now because one of the things you're doing, I gather, is uh, trying to enlarge your visitors base by staging a party first Thursday of every month. Somebody, a woman, went. And here's what she had to say. Roll clip, please. We changed positions. Playing golf on the ice. <laughs> Ones here. This place, the way it works is like a lot of places you can't bring food or drink, so obviously if you can't bring food and drink in here, there's nobody in here. So Brian and I finish our food and drink and now we're roaming this room. So much art, I can't even, it is so much art, so much art, so much art. <laughs> okay. Uh, the millennials do love to be wined and dined and they like their food and they like to bring their drinks wherever they want to go, but that may not be consistent with our mission. Uh, your mission or what is consistent with, you know, the, the, the beauty that surrounds them. So how do you handle that tension? Uh, this is very much part of the invitation. So I think about drawing new audiences in two ways. I think about building an invitation or a welcome that helps people see themselves in our places. I've done a lot of visitor research in my past and visitors have told me, uh, young visitors and visitors of um, diverse backgrounds have told me they don't imagine themselves there. They imagine people different from themselves as being our visitors. So somehow or other we have to craft an invitation that suggests that they do belong at our institution. The second part of that is then we have to deliver a program that um, meets our mission and uh, aligns with their values. So First Thursday is a good example of that. It is an invitation to a party. It is, there is food, there, um, there are small plates um, and a lot of um, different co special cocktails. So it does have a festive and an event nature to it. But art is still at the heart of it. So artists are invited to um, create experiences in gallery spaces. There are art making opportunities. There are pop-up talks, short talks by curators and other experts so that we weave art into the social nature of the event. And like Jeff, can you tell whether or not the people who are attending these kinds of let's get the kids in the front door, yeah. whether they're going to be the members of tomorrow? That's a really good question. We can't draw a direct causal relationship. As a researcher, I need to under, underscore that. But we do know that our percentage of visitors who are in their 20s have grown by 5% in the last four years. So that's encouraging. Yes. Barry. Yes. I hear everything is beautiful at the ballet. It is. Or at least so they said in a chorus line. <laughs> Uh, you guys ended last season, I think, with a little modest surplus as well. So we do we infer from that that you have no financial pressures at the ballet? None at all. No? <laughs> <laughs> they have married. I mean, I'm, I'm far less uh, interested in sort of banding about the word crisis, and I like to talk about challenges. I think the arts community 20 years ago had challenges that were unique to that time, and we have challenges that are in, unique to our time. Um, uh, but this idea, I sometimes think that this idea of constantly um, uh, positioning that the arts are in crisis perpetuate a, cri perpetuate a crisis. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm actually quite hopeful. I'm the most optimistic today as I've been at any time in my career about the future of the arts. I think as, we're, as we live in a world driven by technology, it, it forces us more to want to have human engagement and human contact. And, um, uh, and so I actually I, I feel quite positive about the future. Is part of your positive approach to this the fact that you've got a relatively new hall which still you know, kind of dazzles when you're in there for the first yeah. uh, few times and people are not quite bored with it yet, if I can yeah. put it that way, because it's well, still pretty it's, new. It's seven years in, so um, it's not as new as it once was. Um, I, it is a dazzling hall. I think it'll be dazzling for the next 50 years. Um, but I think ultimately our responsibility is to make sure that what happens when the curtain goes up is, is dazzling um, and that that experience reflects uh, the interests uh, of the community that reflects, uh, that's relevant to today's people. 
And, um, and that's something that we're constantly thinking about. How do we preserve the master works that are part of our, our legacy and at the same time advance the art form and, and push it in new and exciting and different ways? Jeff pointed out, you go to a movie, you're going to hear classical music in a movie. Yeah. We're surrounded by art. I mean, there's art, there's art in the wall of this studio. There's art yeah. everywhere you go. Ballet's a bit different. Yeah. Ballet, you kind of have to seek out. Does that make it a tougher sell? You know, everybody dances. I mean, dance has been part of everybody part of dances, the human experience. But not everybody does in a tutu on, on their it's toes. It's true, and we don't only perform in tutus. Yeah. Have you <laughs> been to the ballet lately? <laughs> uh, you know, it, the thing is, I think people get stuck on the word ballet. I think ballet, the word ballet, sometimes is a barrier to people entering into the into dance. Um, uh, ballet is a specific form of dance. It is at the root of the National Ballet of Canada, there's no question. Um, but I think uh, we're committed to expanding how people perceive that word. Um, and, uh, and, and what I'm finding is that audiences are really responding. I think there are people that identify with the full-length story ballets. That's what they love. They love that, that, that sort of narrative experience. And then there are, there's a whole new generation of audience that's really excited about contemporary dance uh, and, and, and loves the athleticism and the sexiness and the, the edginess of, of great contemporary work. So I, I think, I think uh, again, I think the future is bright for dance. In which case, if the word ballet is a problem for some, have you thought about a name change, the National Dance Company of Canada or yeah. something like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Uh, just as we show clips over here, I want to show a clip from the ballet as well. It's not only a question of who's attending, but who is also performing. So let's watch this clip here. Sheldon, if you would, roll the clip. This was the first company that I really actually saw perform. I saw them at the Kennedy Center uh, doing Apollo and just all of these, you know, bodies that looked like mine, I guess. There's this conversation about um, race and dance and the stigma of they just won't blend in in your sea of swans, <laughs> okay? I went to see a purple swan in my imagination. I think African Americans are more muscular, have more muscle definition, and that's not necessarily always an acceptable aesthetic. For ballet, um, the coarseness of the hair, uh, that's not very convenient for ballet. I used to dread putting my hair in a fringe twist because I was like, I look like a dinosaur. My hair doesn't do that. It doesn't do what is classically acceptable all the time. Okay, so you sort of touched on this, but again, there will be people for whose impression of the ballet is a very skinny, white girl in a tutu and that's not Toronto anymore. So uh, my question is, how much pressure do you feel to sort of reinvent what our idea of the ballet is, given the diversity of the city? Yeah, I mean, I think I, we think about it all of the time. Um, in the ballet field, um, there is a physical requirement that has little to do with race. It has everything to do with um, what's required of, of, um, of the pursuit. So uh, I would say, uh, we are we are incredibly diverse in our in our ranks. I think um, what's lacking in the ballet world is is what I would define as visual diversity, um, and uh, there are a lot of people thinking about this. Um, I were I ran the Atlanta Ballet, a uh, city that's 66% um, African American. Um, we had in our school in our academy um, a huge, uh, uh, probably 75% of the population of the school at that time. Um, were African American, yet when we got to about the age of 12, um, there was a disconnect. They, and, and my belief is that they would come to the theater and not see themselves on stage. They wouldn't see themselves reflected back, and so they pursued they lost other, interest. they lost interests. Mm -hmm. I also um, found in conversations with um, the African American community in Atlanta that, that college education is a, a, an extremely high priority. Mm -hmm. And for many years, uh, D dancers had to make a choice. They had to choose between a professional career or a college education. Um, now, major ballet companies around the world are aligning with major universities to make sure that dancers have the opportunity to pursue uh, higher education while they're uh, pursuing this this uh, art form. And um, and so those so we've opened up opportunity that I think you're going to begin to see um, reflected on stages around North America and around the world. I think the work that Misty Copeland is doing um, as an ambassador is is uh, is important work um, and uh, I think I think it will have a ripple effect your three institutions have been around for a very long time your yours hasn't been so I'm going to start by asking you for those who don't know what's the Luminato festival 
It's an annual multi-arts festival that happens every year in June and that tries to take over the whole city. <laughs> you say tries to take over the whole city. I think it actually does. Oh, good. Great. Well, <laughs> you know, I didn't anyway. want to sound too self-assured. <laughs> it tries to. And, and where he's dance and he's music and she's art, you're kind of everything, aren't you? Yes. And I think, you know, with that, we do really follow a trend that is happening more and more within the art artistic community that actually artists are more interested in breaking away or, you know, or they are interested in sort of interdisciplinary work, you know, breaking away from institutions. And I think that is really where the big challenge for a lot of institutions lie, uh, lies, that actually artists are not necessarily working within sort of those walls of the institution anymore, sort of physically and um, mentally, and uh, and that is sort of where the institutions need to change. And the great thing about a festival is we're an arts organization without an institution, without walls. So not only that, but also, I mean, he's a whole year, he's a whole year, sure. she's a whole year. Sure. You're ten days. Yeah. How does that change your mandate? I think it cha it changes obviously, you know, considerably. I mean, we we don't sort of have that contact with our audience, with you know, with our donor base, with you know, education and outreach kind of program for you know for that long amount of time. We have to we have basically ten days to deliver our message, and we have to sort of create that explosion over you know over that um, kind of time. And to me. Uh, the festival really should do in this city what no one else is doing. You know, if I did, why would I do a version of Coppelia or why would I invite an orchestra to do, you know, a Mahler cycle or whatever? I think that is really where, you know, we sort of try to sit in between everything and we sort of try to open up those cracks and really create something amazing out of that. How much awareness do you think the, I was going to say the cultural community, but let's go beyond that. People who want to go see cultural stuff, how, what percentage of them do you think know what Luminato is? Oh God, that's a tough question. You know, I, I mean, I, th I think it's, I mean, it's, it's something that is still establishing itself. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, within Toronto, I don't think we are sort of completely there yet, where it's something that is indispensable. Like TIFF, for example, is something indispensable. I think if they said, you know, we're going to move to LA next year, you know, all the stars won't have to travel that much. It's just going to be easier. You know, they don't have to book all the hotels. You know, there would be an outcry in the city. And I think that is sort of something that I really want to reach at some point. And I want to, you know, hope have that blind trust in a way that people are just going to say whatever happens at Luminato, it's, some, it's going to be something that I can't see anywhere else. And that is going to be unique and that only happens here in Toronto at this time. And that's why I have to go. Shall we give people a peek? Sure. Roll the clip, please. Apocalypses is an oratorium by Murray Schaefer, R. Murray Schaefer, the greatest Canadian contemporary composer. It's directed by Lemmy Ponifazio, a Samoan choreographer and director, and he's creating a new staging, a new vision for this piece, which is probably going to be the largest performance that has ever happened on a stage in Toronto. Apocalypses is uh, really the destruction of the world. <laughs> and the recreation of the world, the improvement of um, what was going on. You get the idea that there's a lot of energy here and it's getting bigger and bigger, building of, uh, of a whole empire of sound. It's about 13 different choirs, many different um, orchestral groups, 1,000 performers from all different areas coming together to create this ritual that the audience will be part of, this cleansing that will be the main project of our 2015 festival. First of all, Jörn, I'm so sorry your barber died. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I ran out of gel, sorry. <laughs> so, new, large, unusual spectacle, that's the ticket for you guys? Well, you know, I, I, I mean, I think, I mean, this is a very, very special project, Apocalypsis. You know, there's a thousand performers on stage. And what's actually really wonderful about this piece is, I always say my ideal audience is the subway. And with this piece, we actually have the subway on stage. It's really amazing. Which I mean, stage? It's going to be at the Sony Center, June 26 to 28. And, you know, it, you always, when you think about classical music, you think about sort of, you know, white Europeans in a way. But in this piece, we have, we have People from you know 12 to 82, you know all colors from all walks of life, um, and they're coming together to create this amazing performance, which is really wonderful. And it's you know by arguably the most important Canadian composer. So this is really I think celebrating 
uh, 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 Canadian greatness and bringing people together to create something and almost having your audience on stage. I mean, we're almost sold out with a thousand performers in the hall. You know? <laughs> You're originally from Germany. Yes. Give me a comparison between, and be honest with me here, okay? Toronto audiences compared to an audience that you might see in Berlin or in Hamburg or Paris or, or Atlanta or Boston or whatever. Go ahead. I mean, what's wonderful about the audiences here in Toronto is that they're extremely attentive. Once they are there, they're the most wonderful audience that you can get. They will listen. They will, they will you know, try to soak in. They come to pre-performance talks. They ask incredibly amazing and wonderful questions. And they get really moved. And they're not judgmental. And they're very open-minded. But to get them there, that's the hard part. And I think there is sort of, there's a little bit of this feeling, you know, if I don't know something, I'd rather not go because, you know, I might feel uneasy about that. I wish they were a little bit more adventurous. Whereas in, in Berlin, where I come from, you know, it's about you want to see everything first and you go, you know, because it might be the next great thing and, you know, otherwise you're going to miss out and you can't talk to your friends about it. But people are extremely judgmental. You know, they boo, they walk out of the theater. <laughs> and here it's a different, you know, they're, they're a, a lot. Standing ovation all the time. That's true. I, I, know, Toronto, I know. I know. Toronto, the easiest they standing, love their ovations standing ovations. To get. They That's, do. You're right about that, yeah. yes. But getting them in is a challenge. Yes. How about uh, you in terms of the Toronto audience versus, well, you ran Atlanta. Sure. Make the comparison. Yeah, I mean, I find, uh, I find the, the Toronto audience to be more European than American. Um, I think they're uh, at what least... That, what does that it, mean, anyway? Um, I think it's, a, it's a, an audience that's really hungry for what we're doing. The people that are coming are really hungry for what we're doing. Um, and they want to talk about it, and um, they want to engage in it in a way that, in a in a very active way, versus sort of a passive way, and um, and I find that to be more, in my experience, more European than American. I think it's uh, American. It's, uh, America has you know this attention deficit culture um, <laughs> that we live in sound bites, and here people really want to engage. They want to experience and engage. So, um, which I I think is fantastic. Um, we just need more of them coming. Sure. Where, you work in the States, right? I have, For a while? Yes. Where? Mm -hmm. at, in Kansas City at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. Okay. The uh, average art gallery goer in Kansas City or any other big American city compared to what you're seeing in Toronto? It's pretty consistent with what we see in Toronto. Same kind of thing? Absolutely. And Jeff, how about you? Toronto Symphony goer as compared to a Cleveland Orchestra goer? Or I LA? think it would, be, it would be very similar. And actually, what we, I was down, actually down in Cleveland recently, and we were chatting, having this very conversation with the League of American Orchestras. And to live as a classical music organization in the world's most ethnically diverse city, and yet look around and realize the audience in no way reflects that. We're really, at this point, serving about half the population that we could be serving. So I often say to people, you know, Toronto has this great size, but culturally, if we're leaving out half the population, we're actually more like the size of a Calgary or Winnipeg than a Toronto. Mm -hmm. So part of the big opportunity is how do we ensure that that audience is really reflecting the city that we live in? You've got the whites. You've got to find the rest. Is that the idea? Well, it, it's that. It's, it's reimagining, in a way, how we frame the content. So obviously, a classical music organization, part of us, part of our, our programming has to be legacy-oriented. But as we start thinking about commissioning renewal and really creating a voice or an opportunity for new composers in a city like Toronto, what does that look like? And it can't be done in a tokenistic way. So it's not only trying to attract diversity in our audience and donor base, but also we have to reflect that on stage. That means orchestra members, that means the content, the kind of programming partnerships we create. I have no clue about this, so you let me know. It's pretty clear from what you're telling me that white audiences enjoy going to hear Mozart and Beethoven and Handel and Bach and OK, and so on. Do you have any research that indicates that a black audience or a South Asian audience uh, is less interested in them and wants to hear something more from their original part of the world, that kind of thing? Uh, no, I think there's a, an exposure challenge. So for adults, we have a number of programs in adult education, including running our own radio show now in terms of uh, really showcasing what it is we do and, and uh, the programming itself. So I think exposure is an issue, but I think there's also in, uh, in Western cultural context the sense that there's a hierarchy of artistic practice. So in music, people in the classical music world kind of believe that classical music is a higher form of music than any other, which is not true. And the whole packaging of classical is wrong. So I think we're excluding a lot of people. And in fact, I have many experiences in Toronto with people from different ethnic communities who love classical music. And I say, well, have you been to Roy Thompson Hall before? 
and they say, well, that's not a place for me. Like my type of people aren't really welcome there. <laughs> so there clearly is a barrier to participation and that is partially content, but also how we frame the overall experience as well. I just happen to have a couple of clips that may reflect what you just said. Two different clips, both having to do with uh, symphonic music, two very different locations. Roll tape, please. Okay, that uh, handful of TSO members in Raptor shirts going, let's go Raptors at the end, has five times as many viewers on YouTube as that exquisite, fabulous Peter Ungen conducting the TSO out of Thompson Hall, beautifully shot, beautifully edited, and so on. What do you infer from that? Well, I think we're going to become a, an NBA franchise uh, <laughs> that might be more uh, successful. Certainly for us, that was obviously an orchestration of a Drake tune for a small ensemble. So there's a couple of layers to it, obviously, by, in a way, showing the audience, and we're doing this more and more, that our musicians are people. I actually think I have, I have to give the National Ballet full credit when Karen Kane came in. Showcasing the individual dancers the way they have is really important. And so I think for a lot of people, they have this assumption the classical musicians can't possibly be interesting people who like the Raptors and sports and buy groceries <laughs> and all that stuff. So I think there's that overlap with the sports audience that's attractive there, and certainly a Drake arrangement is, uh, is an easy way to get people to uh, to see what you're doing. But I, you know, I think the challenge we have on the internet is how do you get attention, and how do you garner the right attention around key projects? So I think that's really more about programmatic innovation and the Drake thing is a it's a fun example but the you know going forward for us it's how do we in Canada for example partner the TSO say with a Universal Music or Polaris Music Prize to really create some interesting new creative opportunities that draw in that audience but also create something artistically that really is pushing the envelope of what is musically possible through the TSO. I'm going to use a word now that I suspect all of you hate but you, I mean it's the reality of the business that you're in and that is do you have to be Barry let's start with you do you have to be, do you have to seem, do you have to appear less elitist than you are in order to attract those new audiences, those more diverse audiences? I think we have to be authentic. I think ultimately we have to be authentic. Um, uh, I, I've seen uh, too many organizations um, pander to audiences in ways that are, are, are inauthentic. Um, and, so, and so really that's Karen's commitment. I think what we've our experience has shown, so, sort of backing up what you've said, Jeff, that that um, 
the new generation of audience wants to connect with the artist as a, as a member of their community, as sort of a celebrity within their community. It's not an elitist thing. They want to know, they, they want to know that these people are, are among us and are part of our community and part of the fabric of our community. And so you'll see New York City Ballet did an amazing uh, marketing campaign several years ago that was, um, that you couldn't imagine the editorials in the New York Times, the hateful editorials about how New York City Ballet uh, was ruining the image of ballet by this marketing campaign because they took dancers and they put them in street clothes and had them talk about things other than ballet. Hmm. And, um, and the reality was it was a transformational campaign. It was a really important campaign not only for New York City Ballet but for the field. Uh, and that's what we're finding here in Toronto is that the new generation of audience, again, um, younger people want to engage with the art form and want to engage with the artists. Uh, and we're really focused on making sure that those pathways are possible. Well, this is going to be harder for Judith because you have mostly dead people whose work you are showing in your <laughs> gallery. So it's hard to engage directly with the artist. But having said that, and again, you push back if I'm wrong here, but if there's a, if there's a sense that mostly 50-year-old-plus white women are going to the gallery, that seems like a fairly elite crowd. Do you have to be less elitist to prosper? I think elitist tends to be shorthand for two things that we've already talked about. One is the um, exposure to uh, participation in the arts as a child. So if your family chose um, arts organizations, arts events as part of their leisure activities, you're more likely to go as an adult. And the second is what Jorn talked about, about feeling a sense of needing pre-existing knowledge to participate, and that's our fault. If our labels next to our paintings speak in art speak from a, sort of a conversation between somebody with art knowledge and somebody else with art knowledge, then um, the art novice who en engages, tries to engage with that work of art feels left out of that conversation. Mm -hmm. So we're really working hard to change the conversation about art, because you're right, we don't have as many living artists, but you, um, we have a lot of art that people can engage with that lives on through time into contemporary. In fact, the quote I've seen you give is that you need to have input from the hairdressers and the mechanics and the dry cleaners. What's special about that? We're looking at um, trying to connect our passion with somebody else's passion. Um, it's hard for people who work in arts organizations to believe that somebody else doesn't have the same deep need for music or art or dance as, as we do. And um, finding out what other people are passionate about and helping them imagine that in our setting and uh, exploring those ideas through art for us um, helps us um, build a bridge between um, where our audience's passion lay and where ours lays. And Jorn, you used the expression earlier on this program. You want your audiences to look more like the Toronto subway, like the people who go on the streetcars and the subway system. What kind of cultural change do you think is necessary for that transformation to take place? I mean, I think it's also, it is also a little bit, you know, the understanding of sort of, you know, in, in Canada and the um, immigration model that sort of exists here in Canada, I think, you know, that you are, you come here, but you sort of keep your national identity in a way. It's not sort of this, this U.S. American idea where, you, where everyone sort of becomes this new American, you know. I think that that does um, change the way that people interact with, with culture and that does change the way, you know, people interact with the city in a way, you know, because, because and there are obviously, I mean, there are mobility problems in, you know, in, 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 in Toronto, I mean, have you tried at, you know, 6 o'clock or whatever when you, you know, would have to come to see, you know, to your curtain to come from Scarborough into downtown Toronto? It's awfully difficult, you know? So, I mean, those things are definitely, you know, they're definitely, they're definitely an issue um, um, in, 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 in reaching that goal. Um, let me throw this out here, and you guys tell me what you think about this. Maybe, is it possible that what is required in this city is not... Uh, a kind of an anti-elitist approach to the institutions that you represent, but rather you need more elites from broader communities. You know what I'm getting at? Does that make sense to you, Barry? Not really. It doesn't make sense? <laughs> I mean, I, I the, uh, yes. I guess the, this. Uh, in other words, can, let me retry this. Yeah. W would you do better if we lived in a world where there were more kind of upper class elite, Chinese, Filipinos, blacks, South Asians, a lot, you know, all of these different communities in the city, which many of you haven't yet penetrated in the ways that you'd like to, but maybe if they, if they appreciated your stuff more, that would solve your problem. But that would assume that uh, economic status 
it equivocates with interest in art, which I don't believe. You know, no, but like, um, come on, it costs I, a lot of money. I, to I don't. I things, think right? if you look at our financial, our economic model, yes, it would be helpful, no <laughs> question. Uh, but when you talk about engagement in art, I, I, I don't agree. I don't think of the National Ballet of Canada, Canada as an elitist institution. What's your cheapest ticket? Where, uh, cheap, cheapest ticket is thirty-five dollars. So you know, I. I, I do think that we're working very hard to create pathways into the institution for people of uh, um, a variety of di different economic levels. We're delivering uh, dance to school children across Ontario and across the country uh, through our U Dance program. So, I, so I, I like to think of the organization sort of from a 360 degree view, and I think it's a responsibility we all have as leaders to, in terms of um, demonstrating the relevance of these institutions in the communities we serve, and that it's not simply about Swan Lake at the Four Seasons Center for those 2,000 people sitting that night. Mm -hmm. That really we are a part. We are a part of the fabric of this institution, of this city, of this of this province, and of this country. True, uh, but. For that same $35, you know an adult can take a kid to go see a movie. Yeah, and I also think that you, you see people putting the money together to bring their kids to see a ball game or a hockey game, and it's, mm. and it's equally expensive. So I, I do think it's about choices. Right. How about you? That issue I put on the table just a moment ago. Um, I think we are an elitist sector. I think in Toronto we have uh, some of the most expensive art in the world, and certainly in North America. So it's a it's a, not a very easy city to uh, to to gain access to. And I think you know from the TSO's perspective, we need to reimagine the entire model. And I think in a way, you know, when people talk about the arts crisis and the decline of orchestras. Uh, the failure really is adaptability. The failure is our institutions, my institution, myself, to be able to reimagine how we change to meet the needs in a changing world. So certainly from an economic perspective, we can build something that's very expensive and very elite and serves you know, very, very uh, more rich people who basically support the institution. Or we can say music's important. Music's important to everybody and we have to reimagine what it is to be an orchestra in today's day and age with technology, with the arts education challenge in a city with gr such great cultural diversity. I know for us our cheap uh, seat is $16 and that is a, a stretch for people, particularly for people who feel I, it's not for me. I've never been before. I'm not exposed. So sixteen one thing, bucks is about the price of a movie, though. That's a pretty good deal. It is the, about the price of a movie. But you know, that being said, I think there are a number of people who are already feeling like they've been excluded or told they're not rich enough, they're not white, hmm. they're not educated enough to come. So one of the things we have started to do is we give our orchestra, all of our orchestra members, our staff, our board, free VIP t passes. So they go around the city through the day, and if they run into someone who says, you know, I've never been to the symphony, I've always wanted to go. I give those out, two free like high-end tickets. So these would be more like the $150 tickets. And the first time you come, it's on us. So we need to think a bit differently about how our institutions interface with the public. And I think it's a very difficult challenge. And I think there's something about what we say to people. Like when I hear from somebody, I'd love to go to the symphony, but that's not a place for me. Hmm. We are projecting something out that is excluding people that's not just about price and price sensitivity. That's a tragedy that somebody would think that. Mm -hmm. Because we've also, from an artistic perspective, if you're to contrast sport with art, mm -hmm. in the sports sector, we encourage everyone to participate, participation, everyone's an athlete, and then the cream rises to the crop and we support those things. In the arts, we measure kids very, very young. And we tell people, mouth the words, you're not good enough, and so on. And, and as a result, they don't feel that they're creative. And in a world that does require creativity, social innovation, and change, we're actually not only are we excluding people from the economic participation in our institutions, but also the more rich opportunity to see themselves as artists, to see themselves as creators, and to really be moved by the kinds of meaningful experiences that you see through our institutions. Yeah, I mean, clearly education is going to be key to this, right? And you, I, I presume the AGO has got school trips coming in all the time? We have field trips coming in all the time, but we recently changed the name of our department from education to learning because we think of learning as much more broadly than school groups and um, I think the ideas of relevance are particularly important. Um, we recently had a show on Basquiat who's a African-American artist from New York who died in the 80s and the question is why would this show be important in Toronto in 2015? Why would it not? And so we really went into our community and uh, talked to people for whom this was an important artist and our walls had labels written both by um, content experts and by community members so that trying to build that bridge uh, between people who don't see themselves there but understand themselves as part of a community that they then see in the museum. And I've asked everybody else, what's the cheapest ticket to get into the Free? AGO? 
So we're free on Wednesday nights. There are museum passes in every public library in Toronto. We're free after three to um, um, high school students every day. Can you tell whether those who enjoy it free the first time will come back six months later and buy a ticket the next time? We're going to find that out. Our Wednesday night is the only evening we're open at this point, and we know that there are people who come who are even members, but they come because Wednesday night's the only night that we're open. Hmm. So this fall, we're going to um, think about changing our hours. No, we are going to change our hours this fall. We're thinking about it now, and uh, we'll see if um, some of those people migrate over to that other evening. And you have a family package as well, right? We do. What does that work out to? Um, I honestly don't know off the top of my head. You know what? I should know because I have it. You have it written I down? Do, yeah. I'm so relieved. No, it's not that I write it down. I'm, I'm a family <laughs> oh, member of the a AGO. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> I, and I should know that. I've, yes. I think it's, I mean, it's probably about 100 bucks for the year or something like that. Oh, a family go, membership. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you meant a family ticket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, our family membership is about $100, $120. Yeah. And yeah. you can go as often as you want. You can come every day. Yeah. That's a good deal. Uh, okay. For you, Yern, how about um, what the, What's the now? You have some free the events, right? Tickets, yeah. yeah, we you have, have a lot of free. we have a lot of free events. You know, you can you can even sing with an orchestra for free <laughs> at Luminata. We have an orchestra karaoke in our opening night. Um, I mean, I think I'm, one thing I want to say is, you know, I think I mean, it's it's sort of this this constant talk about the crisis of the arts. I mean, I I do actually think, and especially the performing arts, they are born out of crisis. I mean, that's what theater does. It's about it's about it's it's about crisis on stage. It's about you know co um, conflict. That's what dialogue is all about. That's what music is about. I mean, there would not be music without conflict. You know, I mean, Beethoven's music is full of that. You know, it's it's sort of battling themes. And I also think, I mean, today we have more art today than we've ever had before. I mean, every six months there's a new art biennial opening up there is you know there's i mean sao paulo beijing shanghai i mean everywhere all over the place art basel is in three or four cities um you know these days there's more and more festivals coming up i think i think i mean that's a wonderful and a very positive kind of thing i think the amount of artists that are being trained in in, in arts academies has has risen exponentially um so somehow you know people seem to be connecting to the arts. I mean, the arts are more important in terms of design. I mean, design is, I mean, people, people talk about design who've never ever, I mean, even my mother talks about design and, you know, buys something, you know, that has been designed by some famous designer or whatever. And I think that's a very positive thing too, you know, which we have to see. I think it's sort of atomizing. The art, arts are sort of, you know, getting more and more uh, uh, split up into very little sort of areas. And that's why, you know, the, the institutions are sort of struggling because, that old promise that you know you go to an institution and you go you know and get a subscription and you go you have an arts education you know that sort of link with your audience that is gone so in a way rather than the audience used to come now the institutions have to come to the audience mm -hmm. and i think that is really the the shift you know that that um people have to that we have to make here's the next question that i think emanates from that and that is that you're all dealing in terms of your future customers with a group of, let's say, millennials who today expect everything for free. They, uh, they rip off their content from the web for free. They can't stand paying. I, I'm overgeneralizing here ridiculously so. But the fact is, our generation expects to pay for stuff, and the generation below us expects everything for free. Are the people who are 20 today, when they're 30, going to buy a ticket to see the ballet? Well, I certainly hope so. I think I, I think of it more as they really want to curate their own content. They're they're interested in creating uh, curating their own experience, um, which is very different than the way their parents and grandparents experienced art. Um, for ballet, that that presents a, a, a probably a greater challenge in some ways uh, because you you uh, you can put a room of a room full of novices together and give them a script, and they can. They can be actors, and you can um, put a group of amateur musicians together, and they can make music. Dance is a bit harder um, to get at, uh, but I think it's something we've got to accept that, and we have to find ways to get at that idea that um, that young people want to curate their experience, and that they're online all the time, looking at things and and uh, exploring and. Um, and how do we connect into that new way of, of mm. thinking? Do you worry about this? Because I, I suspect every time you go to a school and you do a concert, the kids eat it up. I bet they love it. But then they come home and they tell their parents, let's go to a concert and the tickets are going to be 100 bucks for all of us to go, you know, in total. 
They yeah. want everything for free. What I, are they going to do? I think I think the way you frame the question, I would I would challenge in that if we're worried about okay, there's an 18 year old kid who expects to come for free. Will they buy a ticket by the time they're 30? Why is buying a ticket the end point for us? We're, we sell tickets. A, a concert venue is a dissemination vehicle for a musical idea. It's not the musical idea. And I think we intertwine the yeah, infrastructure. Yeah, but you've got to put, I mean, I, we, I hear we, you. We I hear do, the, we the do, difference between the mission. I get the difference between the mission. But you do have to put bums in seats. You, you, have, to, you have to figure out how to pay for it. But there might be different ways to pay for it. Ah. So maybe ticket sales and subscriptions are the wrong idea. If one looks at philanthropy in Toronto, Torontonians are very generous, far and away the most philanthropic city in the country. On average, it's about $11 billion going to charity per year. Of that, the arts get about 130 million. So we're at about 1% of people's charitable prioritization. I think part of the reason for that is we keep flogging tickets and saying, well, we have these failing business models, please help us with a donation. Rather than saying, you know, maybe, maybe the TSO should be a free orchestra. Maybe we shouldn't sell tickets. You know, that, that's an idea. It's a $25 million budget. It would cost, of that 11 billion, $25 million for us to play for free all year. You need some rich benefactor to say, I'm going to sponsor a year's worth of concerts. Yeah, or a little bit of marketing. <laughs> no? <laughs> it's a, <laughs> no, you don't think so? No, this is the problem in America is, yeah. is there are too many uh, arts organizations in the states because of the lack of government support that rely on angel benefactors, where you're relying on one or two or three key donors um, to drive the business model, and it's a disaster waiting to happen. So I you think need the state to pick up you, a bigger... You, you definitely, we definitely, I love the fact that the Canadian government understands the value of, of the arts to its culture and to its economic uh, health uh, and to its vitality. What I percentage think of your budget fantastic. comes from the government of Canada? We're about 24% of our budget comes from, from all government sources. Um, and yeah, if I don't have that coming from the government, I'm, that's money I've got to go find through hmm. private philanthropy and through ticket sales. So that's, a, that's wonderful, and that's something that doesn't exist in the U.S., and so there's this over-reliance on identifying these seven-figure seven annual angel donors that um, I, I think it's a very dangerous um, model to move toward. I think it's really about building the, the middle of the pyramid, about really building engagement and valuing donors um, at whatever level um, of that pyramid that they enter in on. And um, so I actually, uh, the, my reaction was fairly violent to that idea. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I noticed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I worry, because I worry. I see some great arts institutions in the U.S. that are extremely vulnerable. Uh, because they're over-reliant on one or two sources of revenue. Having said that, you wouldn't object if some rich guy decided to write you a check for 25 million bucks and said, quarter million people, I, go to the symphony, it's on me. I, I wouldn't object, and I would rather when 250,000 people come to see me, rather than them buying a ticket and thinking the ticket is what they're there to do, mm -hmm. that they were making an investment in education, in outreach, in the broader idea of what the TSO represents. Mm -hmm. So I would actually argue that because we're so fixated on that economic tool, which is the sale of a ticket, they're actually losing sight of that bigger, bigger relationship. And when I talk to audiences and I say, how do you support the TSO? They say, I buy a ticket. Well, a ticket covers 37% of the cost of that performance. Mm -hmm. So they're actually, we're losing money every time someone buys a ticket. So you know, we appreciate it. But I would rather have someone say, wow, I love what they're doing with sick kids. I love the big education mandate. I love the innovation. I love the dissemination. I love the free content and do bigger things like that. I think Barry's right. If you're reliant on a couple of major donors, that's an issue. If you have 1,000 people in at the right level or 10,000 or 100,000 around a big idea, like a really big idea, and a big idea is not taking the existing infrastructure and doing something incrementally slightly bigger, but it's, I think, a period of radical re-exploration. I think Jorn's point is right. Art is everywhere. We're living in a golden age of access. But I think our institutions, from a design thinking perspective, are not aggressive enough in reimagining what they are and how they relate to their community. Hmm. Judith, in our last minute here, you want to follow up? I just want to add that um, free doesn't always guarantee attendance. The Indianapolis Museum of Art got a corporate sponsor and went free, and, and their attendance didn't increase. So it's, I think your point about ticket sales is important. It's not, that's not the only barrier. We're working across a number of barriers. Hmm. That's interesting. They made it free and more people didn't show up. No. Why do you think? Um, again, it's the, I don't see myself there, but not understanding the value proposition. What's there hmm. for me for t my time that I'm investing hmm. in this? But would you still want uh, a sugar mummy or a sugar daddy to come write you a big fat check and say, next time the Turner comes through town, it's on me? I would love that check. I'm not sure that um, p replacing ticket sales is it. How would we use that money to grow audience is a question I'd love to explore. Hmm.
Interesting. Okay. I want to thank you for Hot Shots from the uh, cultural sector for coming in today and helping us out with this discussion. Uh, Judith Koch and Jeff Melanson. And actually, I buried the lead. Who are you related to? This is a big deal for me. I'm a hockey fan. Oh, Roly the goalie Melanson. Exactly. Yes, true. Roly the goalie. Did he ever play for the Leafs? I think he did he, for a half an hour. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, no? maybe half an hour. I maybe think everyone's I, played for the Leafs for half an hour. <laughs> I remember he was a big shot with the LA Kings for a while. Okay, so thanks to you two for coming in today. And uh, Barry Houston and Jörn Weisbrot as well from the National Ballet and Luminato, respectively. Great pleasure having all of you in TVO tonight. And um, to our Canadian-born friends and to our foreign-born friends, you're all in the same <laughs> place now. All the best. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.